All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, if you're coming on, just pick up where we start. Um, but tonight is the Girls College Information Night. So if you're here, that means you're probably at least thinking about playing in college or maybe have some questions and hopefully we can answer them tonight. Um, for those of you that don't know, my name is Kristen Vlahus. I am, this is my second year at TSC. And um, this is my first year as the U15 to U19 director. I have big shoes to fill and, and Jeff Lightman, who's done an amazing job in this role previously. Um, and with us tonight is Ronnie Woodard. So you guys are in even better hands that she is on this call um, to talk about her experience would take the entire hour. So I won't do that, um, but she has extensive experience at the college level. Um, if you don't know, head coach at Vanderbilt for a number of years, um, that's probably where a lot of you know her, and then also an extensive kind of time with U.S. soccer in a number of roles, um, and now also being an instructor. So I don't know how she does it all, but we're very fortunate to have her on this call. Ronnie will be going through our Q&A. A lot of you are probably familiar with the chat function, but if you can direct any questions that may come up as we're going through this presentation, please direct them to the Q&A and it kind of gives us a better, better way to track the questions and that way we can really get to everyone and then bring up any questions that may be relevant to the whole group. Um, as we get going a little bit here too, I do have background in, in the college world as well. I, I played in college and then got to spend a number of years under a fantastic head coach as an assistant coach at Georgetown University. Um, so certainly not as experienced, but have a lot of knowledge on the college game as well that hopefully we can help answer some questions and give you guys a better idea of what to expect in your recruiting process. So first, uh, just kind of a graphic um, TSC in college and where some of the players have landed to this point. Um, you can see a lot of different schools. You can also see it's a little bit regional based um, and that would be typical, you know, any club anywhere. It's always going to have a little bit of a regional component, um, but we have a number of players at all different levels. And the most important thing I want you to take away from tonight's presentation is that there is a place for you, but do not just think you have to go to division one or you have to go. You're not, your only option is division three and that doesn't interest you. So you're just going to walk away from soccer. There are a lot of options out there. There are a lot of good fits and hopefully um, as a club and then this staff on this call as well, hopefully we can help you kind of navigate what's your best situation. What are you most interested in? Where could we help you find a good fit where you're going to be happy um, beyond just, you know, the top 25 programs or beyond whatever it may be. So looking at some of our players, um, you may know, you know, if you've been in the club a bit, you may know a few of these faces. Um, Anna's obviously had a, a great career down at Auburn. Um, Nora's in her second year at Indiana State, played in 16 games as a freshman, which is no easy feat. So it's incredible for her. And Kate um, has been at Vanderbilt. I had the privilege of being a volunteer at Vanderbilt last year. So I got to spend a little bit more time with, with Kate kind of one-on-one -on -one there. But we have over the past 20 years, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of players have gone on to have success at the collegiate level at all different divisions, all different schools. Um, so it's something that you can see from some of the staff at TSC that they have the experience and then we can kind of help you guys navigate the process and get you placed somewhere where you have a good fit. So going into the divisions a little bit. There are now, this was just updated a few hours ago because the RPI rankings came out yesterday for this season. There are now, <clears throat> excuse me, there are now 348 Division I women's soccer programs, which is a lot. Back when I was playing, I was down like in the 330s. So, it, you know, every year there seems to be adding, and that comes from some Division II teams that are now Division I. There's movement, D1 teams that drop to D2. So there's all sorts of movement that will happen. Those numbers will fluctuate. But understand that there are a lot of options out there. For Division I, there are 14 athletic scholarships. But that is if a program is fully funded. So that does not mean that every Division I school has 14 scholarships to give out. So just keep that in mind. Division II, 265, max 9.9 .9 athletic scholarships. Um, again, those can be divvied up however the coach sees fit. You can get partial scholarships, things like that. But again, only if a school is fully funded. Looking at Division III, um, obviously, it's a whole different ballgame. There are no athletic scholarships, but there are um, merit based academic financial aid. So there's ways that you can kind of combine and, and actually do quite well financially when you think about Division three schools. Um, and then looking at some of the others, the NAIA, 
and then JUCOs. Um, and we actually have a few junior colleges in the area. There's three in Tennessee that all have great women's soccer programs. So that is definitely another option, another avenue to pursue. And again, tonight's presentation is more of kind of an overview of the recruiting process as a whole. As we go through, take note of me, any questions you have or anything that may come up, we would love to talk to you on a more individual basis and answer specific questions too that may help you navigate your individual process. But we're kind of going to go through everything as a whole. All right. So these graphics actually come directly from the NCAA. I think they're incredibly useful. Um, the slide wasn't quite big enough to add in the division two one, but that's available too. And we have resources at the end that you can go to. But as far as time and management at the collegiate level, all of you right now, you know, you go to school, then you have practice maybe three times a week, games on the weekends, and you kind of go about your lives. It's a little bit different when you get to the college level, and it's a little bit different at each school you may be considering. So it's important to know what is expected of you, what is expected of your time, in addition just to being a student at a university where there's certain academic standards and certain things that you need to consider for the first time being away from home, all sorts of different factors. So what I want you to do and what I, what I want you to take away from this slide is that at the different levels, your time commitments vary. For instance, we don't need to get into all the details just yet, but there are less time requirements for a student athlete at the division three level in the spring than for division one. It amounts to almost six weeks where you do not have soccer. If you go to a D3 school in your spring or your non-championship season, than you do at the division one level, which is significant if you want to think about studying abroad or taking internships or whatever else may be. So that is just one thing to consider. Those things may mean absolutely nothing to you, and you'd rather have those six weeks to play. Um, the Ivy Leagues, they have one less, you know, soccer, they have one less week of soccer, excuse me, and they start a little bit later in preseason than other Division I schools. That's something that's a little bit different. So every school, I just want you to have an open mind to what the actual time management requires of that school, what the travel requirements are, and that will help give you a better picture of what your time would be like as a student athlete at that school. Some terms to know, um, you can go ahead and kind of read through too. All this will be available after the fact if you don't want to read each of the terms. I'll kind of just hit the highlights a little bit. PSA is a term you'll start hearing a lot of as you go through the recruiting process. Um, it just simply means a, a prospective student athlete and that you're in high school, essentially. You've started classes for ninth grade. NLI, not to be confused with an NIL. This is the NCAA just wanted to make it challenging for you guys. The NIL stands for name, image, and likeness. That just came out recently. You've probably heard it over and over in the headlines, especially when you're talking about sports like football and basketball. Um, we don't need to get into that side of things, but that's where now you're seeing players being compensated for their name, image, or likeness being used. An NLI is a document that you will sign if you're receiving any type of athletic scholarship or aid to go play at a university. That is why D3 schools will not send a, sign an LI because there is no money associated athletically with the D3 scholarship, well, the D3 commitment, but you will sign a celebratory form. The most important thing, honestly, for me, though, on this slide is the eligibility center. You must be familiar with the eligibility center. We'll encourage you at the latest to sign up during your sophomore year, and we'll see that in a later slide. But the eligibility center is your guideline to make sure that you are eligible come time you start to graduate and go off to college. There are certain academic requirements like core courses, um, your core GPA, which has to be at a certain level, but to that core GPA, you can't have just a bunch of classes like physical education or you know, basket weaving, as my old boss loved to say. It is your core courses that make up your core GPA, your math, your science, your history, and there are certain academic requirements. And they also make sure you maintain your amateur status. So once you enroll, you'll start as you get a little bit older into your junior year before you go on visits, you'll upload transcripts and they'll help you track to make sure you are on track with everything you need to so that as you graduate, you become a final qualifier, which means you just roll right into college, ready to practice and compete. If you are a non-qualifier and we don't need to go into depth here, but if you are a non-qualifier, then there's additional things that you need to do before you are ready to receive any type of aid 
or to even practice um, once you get to college. Going through different things as far as visits, an unofficial visit is essentially a visit to a university where it is paid for by you, you or your family. However you get there, you take care of the transportation, you take care of where you're gonna stay at that visit, all of that. To separate, and we have this question on, on the men's presentation as well, you going this summer and driving around, touring a bunch of different schools, driving through campus, walking around, doing an admissions presentation, that does not count as an unofficial visit. It is only if you have some type of interaction with the coaching staff, if you are given some tour that is not what is readily available to all students through the admissions tour, and the easiest example of that is if you tour like the athletic specific facilities, if you see the soccer locker room, things like that, places where anyone on campus couldn't get to, um, that is when it becomes an unofficial visit. If you spend time with any of the student athletes, et cetera. Um, and we'll get into some of the, the dates later on, um, but ultimately you can take as many unofficial visits as you want, as long as it's not during a dead period. Official visits now are when they're paid for by the college directly which is great if you wanna go visit a school on the West Coast or up in the Northeast, you won't have to worry about the cost of flights or anything like that. Um, so it can be very, very useful. There are restrictions, mostly on division one schools. You can only take five for instance, um, but then we get into some different details when you talk about D2 and D3, and we'll get into that at a later slide as well. The dead period, um, is a little bit more applicable for the girls than it is for the boys again, because there is a big dead period now in place. And as a college coach, I loved when it was implemented. I was very grateful. Um, but December 15th to January 5th is the most common dead period now on the women's soccer and at the, the collegiate level. So this means during that period, and that's why you might've noticed that a lot of tournaments or events that used to fall just after Christmas, things like that, they had to get moved to a different period because coaches are not allowed to make any face-to-face -face contact, no recruiting, nothing can happen during this dead period. And that is the same for the NLI signing period, um, which is typically November this year, I think it's November 7th through the 10th. So those are dead periods. Um, so you can't go take a visit to a school, let's say December 16th, you're off from school, you want to go take a visit and meet with the coaching staff at a school that's, you know, close by way, maybe where you're going for the holidays, you will not be able to interact with a coach during that period. Just getting into the recruiting timeline a little bit here. Um, so on this call, we have people everywhere. We've got some seniors, we have freshmen, everything in between. So kind of, again, take what the information we're giving you and figure out how it best applies to where you are currently in the recruiting process. If you are a freshman, the most important thing you can do right now is take care of your academic requirements. Make sure you are starting strong. Your GPA matters, your academic standing matters, beyond just your core GPA, I should say, just beyond that, how you set yourself up for the next four, three, four years of high school will have a direct impact on where you maybe wanna go in college. Educate yourself both on and off the field. So watching games, trying to get more familiar with the college game, watching high school games, whatever it may be, just educate yourself both on the recruiting process on the academic side of things, but then also as a soccer player, how can you start using this time to continue to grow and develop on the field? If you are in your sophomore year, now is the time where we've got to be a little bit more focused and we need to start kind of coming up with a list of schools that may be of interest. Some of the times it's your, you know, your parents can help you kind of jumpstart that process, but as you get into it, start thinking about what may interest you. And I understand that during your freshman or sophomore year, your interests may change from when you're a junior and senior, and that's okay. We can add as we go, but the most important thing is that we kind of have a place to start from. And being intentional to add variety to that list. Don't just list, go, you know, go to college rankings, look at the top 25 women's soccer schools and just use that as your list. That's not gonna get you very far in the recruiting process. Have variety. Maybe schools right now, you're interested in every school that's in the, 50 mile radius of Nashville, but in a year, you may be interested in going a little bit farther from home. So adding variety is important. We already talked about the eligibility center, make sure you're registered in your sophomore year, and then start reaching out to coaches at schools of interest. They cannot contact you, but this is when it's important to start getting your name out there. 
And you can do it the same way by sending your schedule when you go off the showcases, going to ID camps. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later on, being intentional with which ID camps you go to and not just going to anyone that reaches out. Going into your junior year, you start to narrow the schools that, have, that you're interested in. Starting to take visits is probably the best way to narrow that list. Once you get on campus, kind of seeing whether or not you could see yourself there, that will help kind of refocus that list a little bit. Same with meeting with coaching staffs, attending other matches. Um, and then the final part there, some people get a little bit nervous with scheduling an SAT or ACT your junior year. We understand that you haven't maybe had all the academic requirements that will help you get the best possible score on that test, but it gives you an idea of how far you may be from the finish line. There may be certain schools where you have to get a certain score. And if you are, let's say you're taking an SAT and if you're 600 points off that score, chances are you're not going to make up the difference in a year. But now you have an idea of what schools and what academic standards maybe will be a good fit for you. Then into your senior year, obviously you can retake that test if you need, kind of narrow that list even farther. You must, must, must start applying to universities, even beyond the ones that you're looking at just for soccer. It's always good to have options. And then FAFSA for parents, don't know what that is. Obviously, we can go into more detail at another point, um, but it's good to know because sometimes, honestly, we've seen a lot of situations where a player just may qualify for more in financial aid than they would as an athletic scholarship. And that's a way where school becomes an option and more affordable for the family. All right, how to start the recruiting process. The one question that I would encourage you to have as you start thinking about schools is if you take the soccer out of the equation, if soccer is not part of the school itself, would you still be interested in attending? So that's where you look at, you can see that list there. Academics, different majors. Again, if you are a freshman or sophomore, the chance of you knowing what you wanna do for the rest of your life is probably slim and that's okay. That's where you should be in life. But maybe if you're a little bit older in this process too, that you know kind of what you wanna study, then maybe that's something that you really need to be focused on schools that have that major or something that you do want to focus on. The size of the school, the community, is it urban, rural, how far from home? Um, players may not be asked, you know, thinking of the cost of attendance, but parents, you know, that is a realistic part of the process. We've got to be realistic on what, you know, as a family you can afford and if it fits into some of your soccer desires. And then lastly, soccer fit. And this is, in my opinion, arguably the hardest part of the recruiting process is figuring out what school are you a good fit for soccer wise. And that takes us to this little graphic here. You can kind of see it. I'll give you a second just so you kind of figure out what's going on. Um, the green is obviously what you'd consider more of an impact player at a university. That's someone who's kind of always starts on the field especially in a close game, something like that. Depth player players that probably won't see too much field time unless the team's up by a lot or it's, you know, a certain game. And then the core players, you know, can vary. It depends on any given day, what team you're playing, things like that. So if you look across, each one of you can fit this mold with four various schools. So, I mean, College A, and I don't need to get into specifics, but for some, you know, College A, a dream school for some, maybe Stanford. I don't, I don't know if you like warm weather, if you like being on the West Coast, you know, Stanford, who's arguably had, you know, a, a, always seems to have a good soccer program. So you may be, that may be a school where you're never really going to play, but you just would be so thrilled to be in that environment, to be a part of that team, part of that community. Or for others, you know, you might think about a close a school closer to home where you know from day one you're going to step out onto the field and you're going to be an impact player and you're going to start every game and you're going to play all four years. Um, and that's what's the right fit for you. There is no right answer. And that is the most important part of the recruiting process. You may have friends 
who everyone's just trying to go to the best possible schools from a soccer standpoint that they can, but that may, may not be the right fit for everyone. It, it, you may have to look a little bit closer and to see what's the right fit for you. Where are you going to be happy? What type of environment are you going to be happy in? And then also understanding that how your soccer fit plays into it also affects the recruiting timeline. So if you are going back to our Stanford as college A, if you are that depth player in the recruiting class, there probably is going to be very little, if any, scholarship money, athletically at least. The timeline is probably going to be a lot later. They're probably going to focus on those impact players first. Um, so once they kind of finalize whether it's four or five, whatever they're going to take in that class, then they're going to start filling out those kind of last recruiting spots. And also they, they want to know that that player, no matter what, is going to do what they need to in the classroom. So they want to see someone who's got great grades, who won't be an issue, is a great kid, a great teammate, and all that kind of plays into the timelines. Whereas if you're looking to be an impact player at a school, your recruiting timeline might go a lot faster than you're ready for. So there is to look at it in the sense that the timelines of schools may not always line up to what your timeline is. So a school may put you on a little bit of pressure just to make a decision earlier because you are that impact player and they can't afford to lose their top two or three in that class, whereas you may not be ready to make a decision. So I know I went on for a while on this slide, but I think it's very, very important to understand soccer fit and timelines. That graphic, the visual will hopefully kind of give you a better idea. I think this kind of summarizes the recruiting process. Um, and so if you have any questions, feel free to follow up on that. Intro emails, we don't need to go through all the details. I'm sure your club coaches have already prepared you with all of this, but feel free to read it over. The one thing I will say, and this will touch into a little bit about sports recruits, it is so important that you personalize emails so that coaches don't just get mass emails where it's the same template with nothing specific. It won't make the coach feel very special. And trust me, as coaches, we want to feel special. <laughs> um, and then down there under email address where it says ID camp information, just so you have some understanding of, of how it works when you send an email off to a college, what tends to happen, and this is why I've included assistant coaches as well. There's someone on staff, there might be multiple people on staff, but there's someone on staff who makes sure that that email and that person's information that player's information, excuse me, is then uploaded into their database. And from there, they'll get watch lists. They will be able to track players in a specific recruiting class. But then, and here comes kind of the question mark as we get into this ID camp information, you also get entered into their system. So when they're getting ready for an ID camp, they are going to send a mass email to everyone in their database, which means all the players that have written to them and say, hey, just letting you know, we have an ID cam coming up, would love for you to come. Now, don't get me wrong, there are times where you will get a specific email from a school who really wants you to come to that ID cam, but just understand how the process works so that you don't always assume that if you get a 50 ID camps, you have 50 schools who want you to come to that specifically. So just be aware that that's how it works. When you send an email, you enter into their database and that's how they track the recruiting classes. Follow-up email, very important. Just even sending thank you for coming to my game. It goes a long way with schools. The more you get your name out there, the more you are persistent, the better chance you have of making an impact and getting in contact with that school. So follow up after tournaments. If you know someone's coming to your game, whatever it may be, find a reason to follow up, give more information, and also be sure to include that club cop club coaches contact info, excuse me. TSC player profile. Um, this is just a way to keep all of your information in a nice, useful document. So then you can send off to the coaches and now it's a lot easier for them to input into their system and also kind of keep track. Just something to consider. Social media. We all love social media these days. Um, you can kind of read over, I'll give you a second, kind of read over some of these situations. These are real life scenarios. 
I will give Ronnie a second as well, because she did an amazing job explaining this in the, in the men's presentation. So I'll give her a second to, to come on here as well, but read over this for a second and then Ronnie will hop on. <laughs> so, so as you read over these, you know, keep in mind, I just wanna, I, I wanna share with each of you the importance of being very responsible with your social media posts. Um, I have a couple of stories to, to back up this information, but the overlying comment that you need to make sure you get out of this is college coaches want good people in their program. And when they want good people in their program, they are committed to doing some research, to having conversations with coaches, to having conversations with teachers, to having conversations with directors of coaching, and to stalk social media to make sure that they are getting the right person for their program. Now, keep in mind, this is a given to begin with, but you should never be retweeting, reposting, or posting, or sharing anything that you would not be proud of to represent you. That's one. Two, and you certainly don't want your grandmother to read any of it. And if you were going to be disappointing her or your grandfather, then you certainly might want to reconsider if that is your, if you have, that's your measuring stick. I could never let my grandmother or my grandfather down, my mom or my dad down. The bottom line is don't let yourself down. Make sure you make very, very conscious effort to be aware of what people can see. There is nothing that goes away on social media. It can forever be there. And there's a couple of examples that I have. I have one where when I was out recruiting for Vanderbilt, you know, we would be standing in line to get a drink at the concession stand or even in the very long lines to get into the restroom. And I would hear two players talking and they would be rolling their eyes and talking about their coach or talking about some of their teammates or talking about how their team just performed and the instant horror that hit their face as soon as they turned around and saw me wearing a Vanderbilt crest was priceless because they immediately knew it wasn't something they should be talking about publicly nor should they really be talking about that in general but they definitely were making poor choices at the time that so be aware that there are people around you all the time and that your character is important to college coaches. If they think for a minute that they are going to have to chase you down to go to class or ask you to follow the team rules or beg you to participate in team activities, they're probably going to find another player that is just as good of a player as you are, but has a stronger character. Um, another example that I have just one more for you guys is I have a, a, a friend who was on a panel with me one time and we were talking, I think it was at the Richmond tournament and we were on a panel back in the day. And he said that he had a, a player that was actively pursuing him and really wanted to go to his university. And so he left the main area, her team was playing off site, and he traveled off site. He sat his, his chair in a corner sat down, he watched her on the field and she was a good player. And he acknowledged that he said, but the problem occurred when he started to watch her interaction with her, her teammates. And as soon as she saw some, of, as soon as he saw some of the interaction that was negative, the teammates, he kind of raised his eye, gave him, gave her an opportunity to play through it. Well, the coach took her off and subbed her and her behavior on the sideline is what really caused him to pause he walked, she walked right past her coach when he tried to acknowledge her. She went right to her bag in a huff, grabbed her bag and immediately took out her cell phone on the sideline and was hiding it from her coach, put it back in her bag and went and sat down. Now that was an immediate red flag. And that coach picked up his chair, packed his bag and went into his car. And needless to say, that player was no longer getting recruited. And his comment to the group was, if she's going to be treating her teammates and her coach now like that, why would I want to bring that type of behavior into my program? Um, that is not what, what is going to help us win championships or create better people. And so it's really important that you guys understand that the eye rolling for mom and dad as you come off the field or the huffiness with mom and dad and using the fact that you're upset about your performance or how your team performed on the day is not okay. Managing your emotions publicly is a big part of growing up, and it's a big part of your college choice and your experience. Just know 
that people want good people around them and people want good people in their program. And I have no doubt that all of us are great people on this call, but just make sure that you manage your emotions in a positive way so that people let that light shine through, right? Um, so that is my two cents worth. You're welcome, mom and dad. Girls, put your cell phones away and uh, pay attention to your coach, have a really positive outlook on thing and enjoy the opportunity to, um, to play this game. So that's my soapbox. See, aren't you glad I had Ronnie take that bit? It's a, it's a big <laughs> one. It's a big soapbox. <laughs> and it's so important. Very well said. All right, getting into our kind of recruiting calendar a little bit. I'm not going to go through all of this, but as you can see, just so you have an idea of what's coming, this is for Division One. Next, I will be Division Two, then Division Three, and so on. So, a couple of big dates just to keep in mind: June 15th, between your sophomore and junior year, is a big date at the Division One level. That is when you can begin communicating with a college coach directly. Visits August 1st is the big date for Division One. That's when you can begin unofficial and official visits. Division Two, June 15th is kind of that, that big date again as far as correspondence. Um, and then official visits, that is June 15th as well. So they don't have that kind of secondary August 1st date as far as the visits go. You know, those will start as soon as the contact starts June 15th. The one thing to keep in mind though, off campus contact, and you won't see as much of that at, in women's soccer to be honest, but that's going into things like going to maybe a high school event or meeting your family at their house, things like that. That's August 1st. Um, it's definitely something to be aware of because it happens at recruiting events, things like that. Um, but again, it's a little bit less common in our sport than some of the others. There is no limit to the number of official visits you can take, but keep in mind, you can only take one visit, official, excuse me, one official visit per college. And now it was a few years ago when they changed to allow official visits junior year as well. Now it becomes a little bit more relevant. So if you take five visits immediately or however many visits you want, when you start off your junior year after August 1st, if you don't find any schools you love, you cannot go back to those schools and take another official visit. That next visit will be paid for by you or your family. So you can take as many visits to a school as you want, but a school can only pay for one visit. Um, so again, just, just things to be aware of um, so you don't get in any trouble with NCAA. Division three is a little bit different even further because there are no athletic scholarships. So it kind of changes the recruiting process altogether. There is no you know, set date as far as that goes. As far as the official visits though, January 1st of your junior year. So it's a little bit later and that is because the timeline for recruitment for division three tends to be a little bit later than division one or division two. Again, the focus at the D3 level is making sure you have a certain academic standard. A lot of the award or merit um, becomes through your academic academics, excuse me. Um, so again, everything's a little bit later. So you'll see that official visit date a little bit later as well. But again, there's no limit to official visits, no limit to unofficial visits. Um, and just again, keep in mind, all similar throughout the different divisions, but there are little things that you need to be aware of, especially if you're looking at maybe a D1 and a D2 and a D3 school. Well, each school is going to have a slightly different requirements from the NCAA. Possible questions to ask on visits. I won't read those all off, but take a look over them. The one piece of advice I have for you, figure out what questions are important to you, whether it's your major, um, what a typical week looks like, where your time's gonna go when you're a student athlete, what type of travel, how does that impact the school, all sorts of things. But my piece of advice is to ask current players, if given an opportunity, if you're on an unofficial visit or an official visit and you have time with the players, ask them as well. Um, keep in mind, you may have, you may have the visit maybe with a player who was hoping to play in the last game and they ended up not playing. So keep in mind that they may have a little bit of, you know, bitterness, which is natural for any person in a moment like that. 
but try to see if you see trends. If you ask a bunch of players on the team, you're getting the same answer. The coach is saying the same thing. You can kind of take that at face value as well. So I think it's helpful to be able to ask both the coach, the coaching staff, and also ask the players kind of what they see it from their perspective. Some questions that we get often, we kind of touched already on official and official visits. Again, just keep in mind that there are some different rules. If you have any follow-up questions or you're in the process yourself, feel free to reach out directly with any specifics. Can't harp enough, the eligibility center is crucial. Technically, if you are only looking to go to a D3 school, you don't have to because it's not a requirement, but I do not love that advice. I would say everyone regardless should be registered with the eligibility center. If you're undecided, you're not sure what level to go at, even if you are going to D3 school, it will just keep track of everything to make sure that you finish as a qualifier and there's no issues as you go to enroll in the fall. Um, scholarships we touched on early on too, just understand this is only if a program is fully funded. You would be surprised the number of Division I schools still out there, D2 as well. Programs, top kind of big name programs too, who do not have the max 14 full scholarships to divvy out. So that's going to impact a little bit um, as far as the athletic scholarship. It certainly isn't going to act, impact the program in that sense, but just understand. So don't go into a situation expecting a certain amount of money to then be surprised. Make sure you're kind of making the decision as well based on you see yourself as a good fit for the school alone, not necessarily the dollar amount. Um, Division three schools, I will say, you'll be surprised too because they have the ability to stack merit and financial aid. Um, which some schools at the D1 level, you can only get an athletic scholarship or you could go through a financial aid, but you wouldn't be able to combine those because those would then go against um, the program as far as a number of scholarships. So long story short, when you're talking to a coach, regardless of level, discuss any additional aid that you think you may be receiving to go to that sport just to make sure that that is accurate and doesn't have an impact on the program so that they know if you think you're getting another few thousand in academic money, just make sure you discuss that with your coach at the school to make sure that that is actually accurate and you can get that money in addition to an athletic scholarship. It will vary, so please find a way to discuss that. I know those conversations aren't always easy, but it will help you a long way if you do that up front. And then kind of going along that, we've touched on it, but just so you know the terminology, soccer is an equivalency sport. Um, so there's no restriction on how many athletes can be on scholarship, but you can divvy up the 14 scholarships or the 9.9, .9, however you want, whether there's student athletes on 20%, another might be on 40. You could have 28 players on 50, 50% um, 50 scholarship, just so you understand what equivalency is. ID camps, this is kind of what we, we threw out earlier. Um, ID camps are a great, great way to interact with the coaches, to be on campus, to use it as an evaluation as well. It gives you kind of that look behind the curtain to some extent, but choose wisely. Okay, as I said before, once you write to a school, you enter their database. So you're likely to receive camp invites directly. At times you will have a school who has a lot of interest in you reach out, but there will be a lot of times where you're just on this mass email list and you're getting invites to the school who maybe is not interested in you at all. So before you go spend all your time and money chasing all these ID camps, do your homework, do your due diligence. If it's after June 15th of your sophomore year, reach out directly to the coach and say, hey, I'm really considering your ID camp. Are you considering me for your program? And I, I'd be surprised. Most coaches are very, very good about being honest. They're not trying to string you along in the process. So you've got to be honest with them as well and ask for honest feedback. If you can't get the attention of the school, be persistent. Get your name out there early, but then be persistent. Um, my old boss used to have a running joke. You can call nine times during the week, and it's only on the 10th time that we'll get a restraining order. And it's true. There's a lot of truth to that. You have to be persistent. You have to get your name out there. Um, and then keep in mind, though, that every school has a different timeline. So even if it's your dream school, even if it's been your top choice since you were five years old, that program may just not work out and may just not align with your timeline. It's not that you may not 
be a good player for the school, but their needs and where you are in your recruiting process just may not be at the same point. So keep in mind that timelines differ from school to school. We touched a little bit on being a good soccer fit, but again, my biggest advice, ask and be willing to hear and receive honest feedback from your coaches. You can ask the college coaches directly. You can ask your club coaches. A lot of you have club coaches who have extensive experience in the college environment. Um, you know, we're very fortunate to see to have a lot of very good coaches. So ask your club coaches. The earlier you know, the better. There are way, way too many stories of good players who have spent way too much time chasing the wrong schools. And now they've ended up either in a situation where maybe they don't have a lot of options or maybe they don't have options they love because they were just chasing schools that were never going to be the right fit. You look at a school, uh, let's use one of the top 10 teams in the country. If the roster is all youth national team players and you've never been invited to a camp, it's not to say that you can't go there, but it's going to be pretty challenging. So understanding and being realistic and honest with yourself is only going to help in the process. Another way to kind of think about it after permissible contact, so after June 15th, what schools are reaching out to you? That's a pretty good indication of maybe the, the right level as a player. And then you can kind of base maybe some of the schools you're interested in off that. So which schools are reaching out to you? Maybe that's a good indication. Should I speak with my club or high school coaches? Absolutely. You would be surprised how well-connected your coaches are with the college coaches. You'd also be surprised how small the soccer world is. So if we don't know someone directly, we probably know someone who knows them. So it's important that we know where you're at in the process, that we know what you're thinking because we can help facilitate. And then we may also be a connection you didn't realize you had. The other thing I will say to that, and this kind of falls a little bit in the gray area, College coaches can talk to your club coaches prior to June 15th of your June, going into your junior year. The way um, the rule is written is that you cannot talk about where, as a college coach, you cannot talk about where that player would fit in that recruiting class. So you cannot say specifically what your interest is, but you can talk about just general interest. Hey, I enjoyed watching, you know, Susie play on the weekends. Can you tell me a little bit more about her as a player, as a kid? So club coaches can be some of your best resources. They can have contact with college coaches um, and you really want them to be advocating for you. And the way they can best do that is if you keep them in the loop on what's going on. Sports recruits. Um, so I have taken over. Still not sure if that was a good decision or a bad decision on my part, but I have taken over um, kind of running sports recruits for the club. Um, I think it is something that is very useful it, it, if done properly. And we'll get into a couple of slides on it a little bit. But one of the best resources that sports recruits have is the ability to search their database and find schools that maybe you didn't know existed that have a women's soccer program, just to kind of open up your minds to some other options and really use their search and filter tools. They'll give you more information on the school itself. They'll give you direct information on the soccer at that school, including the coaches information. Um, so it, it is very, very helpful. Um, and again, the player profiles, which all of you should have been able to create by now. One big question that I got when I sent it out was when should I make this player profile? Yes, if you're in eighth grade or ninth grade, chances are you really don't need it just yet, but I still think it's very important that you familiarize yourself with sports recruits, that you know how to set up the platform, that you know how to upload video, things like that, because you'll be surprised come sophomore into junior year all of a sudden things will start happening very quickly. So as long as you know what to do and how to set it up, the earlier you can learn that, the better. But yet the bulk of the kind of the recruiting then will be into the sophomore and junior year, into your senior year as well. Um, communicate with college coaches. This is kind of my own little disclaimer from my own experience as a college coach. We want to feel special. <laughs> um, and so sports recruits is great. And that you can send 
they have all the information in there. So you can get the template from them and just send out emails to the college coaches. And that is fantastic. And it is very, very helpful. They've done a lot of hard work for you guys as players. But if you do not personalize those emails, if you do not personalize any of your information coming through their template, then it will look like to a college coach, you just send an email to 60 schools, which to be fair, you probably will, but you've got to do your time, do your due diligence and take the time to personalize the emails to make the college coaches feel special. And then that will kind of help. And that's a way to use it. If you are not going to do that, I would not recommend sending an email through sports recruit. Okay. So that hopefully makes sense to everyone. If you have more questions about that, please reach out. I'd be happy to talk through it in a little bit more detail. The last thing is that the highlight videos is probably the most useful part um, from a player profile standpoint. It is so easy for a coach to click on your link, look at videos, say, hey, oh yeah, I like that this player is you know, attacking outside back. That's exactly what we're looking for. Perfect. I'll add them to the watch list for the next upcoming event. Videos are super helpful in allowing coaches to get a kind of a sneak peek as to who you are and then decide. Obviously, they're not going to make a final decision off video now, thankfully, that the pandemic's you know, in the past to some extent, um, but they will use that as a way to come see you play live with your team. Okay. So videos are very, very helpful. You also, as the player have a way to kind of control what is out there about you as a player. So it's all things that you feel showcase your best traits as a player, um, but make sure that you do take advantage of that. So again, I kind of talked a lot on the last slide, but this gives you a quick snapshot at that college search tool that we talked about. Um, so you could just, for instance, you could type in that you want to stay somewhere in the Southeast or Midwest, the certain size of the school, maybe what division you'd like to play in, and then it will kind of auto-populate all the schools that fit that criteria. So there are schools you may have never heard of that have great programs that academically is exact fit that you're looking for. And this is just a way to get more information about it. I didn't do it here on, on the screenshot, but then you could just simply like click on the school's name. It brings up more information about the university. It brings up more information about their soccer program. And then you can learn as much as you need to or much as you want to. And then the player profiles, almost all of you have probably seen this. And again, the only thing I'll really, really highlight that video section is very important. And then also having your GPA, very important, if you, especially if you're looking at any school with good academics, um, they need to know they're not going to waste their time with someone who maybe doesn't have the right GPA or the right test scores or whatever it may be, where they know there's no chance that that student athlete could get into the university. They're not going to waste their time and certainly not going to waste your time by delaying your recruiting process. We have, before we get to kind of the next steps, we have a little bit of time. I haven't seen any questions pop up just yet. Um, so we got about... 10 minutes till we need to wrap this up entirely. So we'll just give you guys a moment. It's a lot to digest. I also like to mumble and ramble really fast. So you may just need to process everything that just happened over the last 45 minutes. Um, so take a moment, we'll give you a second and you can either pop it into the Q and A, pop it into the chat, um, ask any questions you may have. And then if no one has anything, we can kind of move on and then end the presentation as well. Kristen, do you just want to answer this? What is the best way to upload videos? Splice from VO or another device? Yeah, it's a great question. And honestly, my best answer is whatever you are most comfortable with. I would say the best thing to do is to pull out clips. So whether you splice it or VO or you do something different, whatever you're most comfortable with. I know someone who used to just use uh, QuickTime and just download screenshots of it and whatever it may be, as long as you're comfortable with it, a college coach's attention span is <laughs> it's not very long, to be fair, when there's a lot of recruits to look at. So I would say, you know, for a video that's a highlight type video that you want to get the college coach's attention, short clips, anything under three minutes will really kind of showcase who you are, but give them enough to see whether or not you're a fit. So my best answer, whatever you're most comfortable with, if you have any more questions in detail that you're really not sure how to go about it, feel free to email me or call me, reach out to me directly and I can walk you through the steps.
my daughter is a junior and hasn't completed the NCAA eligibility center. How do we do this? That's a great question. So you can go on to the site and I can send this the it out as well, but it's the eligibilitycenter.org. Um, you will go on and basically you just create your own accounts. You can also go through the NCAA ncaa.org has all of the resources for the eligibility center listed on their website um, you can also just type in the google search ncaa eligibility center it'll pop up and all you do is you create you register and you put in your information and that what that will do is give you an ncaa id number so once you have that that is unique to the player no other player will have that number um, and then from there, you will start inputting information. You, you'll kind of see, it'll help you go through the process, uploading transcripts. If you're a junior already, I would start uploading transcripts. And then as you start to get your test scores, making sure that they get um, pulled into the eligibility center as well. Andrea says, is there any way to know what college coaches attend the showcase events? You want me to do that one, Kristen? Yeah, go for it. So, I mean, they're, they're pretty much billboards walking around the sidelines, to be completely honest. Sometimes um, tournaments will publish a list of coaches that have responded and saying they're attending. Now, other times those particular lists have been populated from years in the past and they just keep adding to it. So they could be misleading. You know, our recommendation is, is to send an email prior to the event of the coaches that you're interested in having CU play. And then as your manager is handing out the team profiles, ask them to jot down a list of the schools in attendance. And then that list can be shared with the team. So I know that the I coach the 05 girls and our manager will hand out our team brochures during the game while they're playing and while I'm coaching. And she'll write down every university that was in attendance for that game. And then at the end of the day, she'll share that list with her team. So um, hopefully that helps. Uh, next one, what types of footage do you recommend including in a highlight reel? Uh, great question. And <laughs> my best answer may be overly simple, um, but whatever clips showcase your skill set as a player. Um, and so the one thing to keep in mind, just as you might get a new coach who decides you're no longer a center back and that you're better suited as an outside back, the same is going to happen um, as players make the jump from the club level to college. So I want to get too locked in in maybe position. Sometimes it is. Sometimes, you know, a player is just a natural, let's say, 10 attacking midfielder, and that's all they're ever going to play. So don't worry too much about being too tactical with the clips is what I'm trying to say. Showcase, if you're an athletic player, you should showcase athleticism. You should showcase your speed, your ability to get in behind a back line, your ability to track down a forward and, and have a great defending moment. If you score goals for fun, obviously you should showcase that you're able to you know, score a lot of goals. If you're a defender who is excellent 1v1 defender, show a lot of moments where you don't get beat, players don't get past you if you're good in the air. Um, so some of that, if you don't know where to start, Talk to your club coach, ask for honest feedback, say, hey, what do I do well as a player um, and have those moments in there. Kristen, here's a good one. Am I still allowed to introduce myself or talk to a college coach, even if it's not past June 15th of my junior year? That is a great question. Um, <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> um, so it depends on kind of the, the environment you're in. So if you're attending their ID clinic, you can absolutely go up, say, hey, you know, my name is so-and-so. Um, you know, I'm only a sophomore still, but I'm just wanted to let you know I'm very interested. The coach, what the coach should do is say, thank you so much for introducing yourself. You know, since you are not a junior yet or going into your junior year, you know, we can't have a conversation beyond that, but, but thank you for taking the time to introduce yourself. So as long as it's not recruiting in nature, um, you're okay simply introducing yourself. With that said, do not be offended by any means, if a college coach simply says, just reminds you of the rule, essentially, hey, we cannot have any, you know, conversation right now, just because you are not of age, you're not, it's not past June 15th going into your junior year. Does that make sense? But I would say, depending on the environment, if you're at their ID camp, it is always good to kind of put a name to a face. Um, so don't, don't 
shy away from that, but just understand what the rule states that they cannot technically have any contact with you prior to that date. And, and Kristen, if I can interject, that also does include parents. Yes, great point. It does also include parents. So the conversation from a parent is, is not permissible either. My Q&A is empty right now and I don't see any raised hands. All right, well then we'll kind of direct you to this last slide, the fact that we wanna help. So there's names and email addresses um, there for you. As I kind of said in the beginning, you know, I am um, the older girls director. Um, you've got Greg on there who's ECNL director. So a lot of you guys who are on here are ECNL type players. You've already built a relationship with Greg or with Ronnie or someone who's kind of helped you in the process. Continue using them as your resource. If you don't know where to start, you're kind of new to all this, feel free to reach out to me. I'm also kind of, as I said, if you have any questions about sports recruits or any general questions, please, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and if I don't know, you can be assured I'll copy Ronnie on an email or two <laughs> and we'll get that question answered for you. As far as the links to your rights, the top one is our college recruiting resources. Um, and so once this is over, we'll save the recording, we'll save the presentation, we'll get that information uploaded to our website so that you can kind of go through some of the slides we're a bit busy and kind of go through and read at your own pace, at your own time. And anything else, we've got a great list of where some of the players have gone in years past. You can kind of see the variety. It may also be like, oh, I, I, you know, she was our neighbor. I didn't realize she went there they're a great person, that player may be a great person to talk about a particular school or their experience. And that gives you an option and a way to kind of talk to someone else that may have better insight than we do at times. The second link is the guide for the college bound student athlete. This is a publication directly from the NCAA. They do it every year. It's similar to what we just did, but it's kind of just an overview, general information, important things to consider as you start to navigate this process and might answer some of the, the questions that you may have as you go through it. So there are two great resources. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out and I'll put you out of your misery uh, by wrapping up and ending this call here. Feel free to reach out. Thank you guys so much for taking the time. I know it's never easy finding time in a busy schedule, but thank you for taking the time to be on with us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you around.